episode 17, What Friends Are For. People ask me how I keep writing my little blog when I am in such a parlous physical state. They may not put it that way, but being at stage 4 can never be a good thing. The simple answer is, with a lot of help, help from my brilliant wife, from health and care services, from family and friends. So how come I am lying on my back on the roof of a high castle tower, with my head sticking out of an unnervingly large drainage hole, being held by a complete stranger with his hands gripping the backs of my trainers? I won't say that my whole life flashed before my eyes. Several burning questions did cross my mind. For instance, what the hell am I doing here? in a country big on faith but maybe not so hot on health and safety. What did I hope to achieve here, and did I do my shoelaces up tight this morning? This could only be Ireland, the country that takes the sir out of surreal. The land where people can give directions like, when you see the white bridge, you know you've gone too far. Apparently everyone goes too far, I wonder why. This is the Republic of Ireland, the bigger southern bit of the island, but I would say to the citizens of Northern Ireland, you're not off the hook I th Actually, the word, hi, is a bit superfluous here. Any slip from any tower would have had me conveniently breaking my fall with my neck. And then there's the contagion risk. For this is Blarney, one of those rare places where hope just might triumph over experience. No. One of those spots where people fervently believe that faith will heal all. Towns like Lords in southern France, or Barnard Castle in northern England, the site of the miraculous vision of the blessed Dominic of Cummings. I have had the Lord's experience, hewing for hours, surrounded by genuine pilgrims who were waiting for their turn to spend a few moments to pray at the shrine of Saint Bernadette, hoping for a miracle to heal their woes and sickness. We shuffle forward very slowly, held back from time to time by Marshal letting in patients from the hospital on the other side of the square. Every so often, these priority cases would be ushered into the head of the queue, much to the satisfaction of the people in our line, who evidently felt that the patients in wheelchairs should have precedence. I sensed that their small sacrifice added to their feelings of devotion and piety. They could take an extra hour of waiting for the sake of people whose need was greater, no pain, no gain, and then came the beds. Those of you who have spent any time in an NHS hospital will know how hard it is to get hold of a hospital porter willing to take you in your bed to another part of the building. Take my word for it, I've been there, done that, got the embarrassing gown, don't get me started on the subject of the hospital gown, that one size slits all shroud of shame, a mortifying symbol which tells us that, no matter how important we were in the outside world, you are now merely the sum of your available orifices. I said don't get me started, what I was trying to say was that moving patients in their beds can be a logistical nightmare, but in Lords there seemed to be an endless supply of volunteers eager to save their charges from limbo, which at the time of my visit was still a part of papal doctrine. No sign of a flimsy gown here. The passengers in their rolling beds were in their Sunday best, dark suits and flowery dresses, and bringing up the rear of the welcome queue jumpers came a portly black figure resplendent in his cardinal's robes. After that, the holy spring and shrine of Saint Bernadette could have come as a bit of an anticlimax, but that is, of course, very much not the point. The same goes for kissing the Blarney Stone, as if it's not on hygienic enough to be sharing the stone with a steady stream of fellow rocusculators. The steady stream analogy has given birth to another rural myth, 
the word on the lane is that every morning the guardians of this treasure take turns to pee on it. No explanation is proffered as to why they might do such a thing. A misguided attempt at sanitization perhaps, or an expression of contempt for the tourists who come to give themselves a short path to eloquence, or simply because they can do but everyone who has shared with me the indignity of getting themselves within kissing distance of the stone will know that the only way that any man or woman wishing to urinate on it could not do so without the assistance of a helicopter and a long rope, a siphon, a funnel and a family-sized turkey baster. At the risk of being wrongly called racist, this story is so typically Irish. Like so many English tourists before me, I don't exactly feel I am Irish, that would be weird, but it is hard to resist the idea that I would fit right in here. Growing up in 1960s Manchester, I certainly knew a fair bit about the Irish, as they were responsible for much of the charm and just about all the disorganised crime. What I admired was their ability to say absolutely anything and their freedom from any kind of guilt. I wished I could get away with saying things just because they sounded right. I am going to take you to a place which could have been anywhere on the Emerald Isle, north or south, it's so typical that I won't name it, but for the purposes of this tale, let's call it Ark Low. I make no apologies that we are here in the pub, I am not going to fall into the trap of talking to a couple of alcoholics and judging the whole nation, and this is such a nice place to come to. Ireland is the only country in the world that doesn't have any Irish themed pubs, so this is a great place to talk. Talking is what it's all about here, idle chatter, gossip philosophy, everything under the sun is fair game. Even the alcohol plays second fiddle, acting as a lubricant to the conversation, elevated to an art form. Only the most dedicated talkers and drinkers are in this early in the evening, though they may well have been here since lunchtime, not counting the barman, who seemed to have eyes only for the tiny television. There were three locals at the bar, initial impressions would have pigeonholed one of them as a distinguished looking old gentleman in a distressed tweed suit, tie and handmade brogues. It was hard to guess his age, but he could have been either mid-seventies or fifty-plus Guinness, the other two seemed to be tramps. They were all talking at once, though I am not sure who to, this being Ireland. It didn't take long to strike up a conversation. Mr. Tweed made his precarious way over to our table. He seemed to be weaving to his own internal soundtrack, presumably a forced ten storm in mid-Atlantic. One of the great things about Ireland is that you don't need an icebreaker to start a conversation with a stranger. The English have 400 years of Protestant guilt to wade through before we can get past hello. Nevertheless, Tweed's opener was a masterpiece of the art, before bobbing and sidling his way over to us. He had seen me inspecting a framed map on the wall, the sort of fake oldie worldie map you only find in pubs. As soon as he was safely leaning on our table he said, so. Are you a chartographer then? Apart from no, there wasn't a good answer to this, but it didn't matter, the hunt for common ground had begun. He found out I was a teacher, which prompted his response. I had a teacher once, pretty lowest common denominator stuff, but it did the job. I learned he was retired and I made the mistake of asking what job he used to do but he couldn't remember. Without a shred of embarrassment, he called over to the two tramps at the bar, do you know what I used to be before I was an old soak? Young soak, ventured little tramp. Tweed seemed happy with that, and he then set about finding more common ground with his English guests, but whiskey lag had set in and the best he could manage was, 
and the white cliffs of Dover will always be white. After a fair few repetitions, the white cliffs had lost their charm for everyone except Mr. Tweed, who seemed set for the night, so it was a relief when little Tramp beckoned us over to join him at the bar. He ordered drinks all round, which brought back the question of how he and Tweed could finance this lifestyle. Guinness and James Sons Chasers may be the finest drink since the 1929 Chateau Lafitte unwashed, but it didn't come cheap. The clothing certainly wasn't a clue. He and his much larger counterpart were dressed in local tramps uniform, dark but strangely greasy trousers of indeterminate origin and color, worn down plimsolls and matching blue cable knit sweaters, which had seen better decades. Little Tramp must have sensed the unasked question about money, and he volunteered that he too was retired, but he still mended the odd bike as well as repairing pots and pans. He was clearly proud of his tinker roots and still called himself the unknown soldier, but he also admitted that he relied on his best friend, indicating Big Tramp. The latter seemed reluctant to step into the limelight that the question of affordability was soon answered. Sitting there in his tramp uniform, he admitted that he owned a fishing boat, well, actually, a small fleet of boats, and the harbour, and the quayside houses, and the hotel and three pubs, including this one, but he seemed happy to hang out with his friends, a truly Irish riches to rags story. So there you have it. You don't need divine intervention, you don't need to have kissed a stone, you can find happiness by engaging in eloquent and witty conversation with the help of an endless supply of liquid black gold and a friend who owns the town, everybody gets what they want, and we all need a helping hand from time to time. Maybe not on the industrial scale with which I consume it but we all accept assistance more often than we would like to admit, that's what friends are for.